Here we're going to prove some important algebraic properties of limits. But before we do that, we need to recall a couple of things. Recall that if we've got a sequence of real numbers a sub n, we say the limit of that sequence is l, and we write the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals l, which here we're not considering infinite limits. If for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a natural number n, such that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, a sub n minus l in absolute value is less than epsilon. In other words, for any epsilon that you can pick, which is very, 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 very small, you can always find a point after which every member of the sequence is very, very close to that given limit. Okay, great. And then the next thing we proved in a previous video was that if we have a sequence that converges, then it's bounded. In other words, there's a positive number m such that the absolute value of a sub n is less than m, and that's true for all natural numbers n. And then finally, we'll need this thing called the triangle inequality, which says for all real numbers x and y, the absolute value of x plus y is less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. So you use this kind of inequality all the time in this type of real analysis course. Okay, so we're gonna suppose that we have two convergent sequences a sub n converges to A and B sub n converges to B. And then we also have a real number C and we're gonna prove four different algebraic properties. Starting with this one that says, the limit as n goes to infinity of C times A n is equal to C times A. So multiplying by a constant does exactly what you would like it to do. And we'll use the standard strategy to build these proofs by first working through some scratch work starting from the end and then rewriting that in the correct order. So let's see what I mean by that. So over here, we're gonna notice that in the end, we want C times A N minus C times capital A to be less than epsilon. If we got some sort of inequality like that, then we would know that this limit was true. So now let's see if we can um, work with that until we have some pieces that we can control. So notice I can factor a C out of this and that will give me the absolute value of C times the absolute value of A n minus A is less than epsilon. But we're actually in luck here because we have some control over the size of the absolute value of A n minus A because we know that this sequence converges. So let's go ahead and divide both sides by the absolute value of C which is allowed because that's not equal to zero by our assumption. So that gives us the absolute value of a sub n minus a is less than epsilon over the absolute value of c. And like I said, we have control over the size of the left-hand side. So if we choose our capital N so that the left-hand side is smaller than epsilon over c, then that will um, result in our goal inequality. So now let's go ahead and write this carefully. So let's say that we're given epsilon bigger than zero, let's pick um, a capital N, which is a natural number, such that for all little n bigger than or equal to capital N, we have the absolute value of a sub n minus a is less than epsilon over c. And like I said, that's possible because uh, our sequence a sub n converges to a. So we can make that as small as we want. In particular, we can make it smaller than epsilon over c. And now we just need to do those steps in reverse. So now notice that that tells us that the absolute value of c times the absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon. But that tells us the absolute value of c times a n minus c times a is less than epsilon. But that's exactly what we needed to show in order to show that this limit was true. So we finished the first algebraic property. Let's move on to the second. Next, we're gonna prove that the limit is n goes to infinity of a sub n plus b sub n. In other words, a new sequence that is formed by taking the sum of the members of the old sequence is equal to a plus b. In other words, the sum of the limits of the old sequences. We're gonna do the same strategy of working backwards via scratch work and then rewriting it carefully. So notice what we wanna end up with is the absolute value of a sub n plus b sub n minus capital A plus capital B is less than epsilon. 
That's our final inequality, which will prove this limit. So now let's see what we can do to that. We can rearrange this into the absolute value of a sub n minus a plus b sub n minus b is less than epsilon. Then we can use the triangle inequality and what we will end up with is something larger by setting x equal to a sub n minus a and y equal to b sub n minus b. Now if this weren't scratch work, that would be a problem, but since we're gonna write our steps in the opposite order in the final proof, this is actually okay. So we'll see that as we move on. So notice here we can have the absolute value of a n minus a plus the absolute value of b n minus b is less than epsilon. But because we know a n converges to a and b n converges to b, we have control over the size of each of these. So we might as well make them as small as we want. We can, we can make each of them less than epsilon over two, but that means they sum to something which is less than epsilon. Okay, so now I think we're ready to write the formal proof. So let's say we're given epsilon bigger than zero. Let's take N1 and N2 such that if little n is bigger than or equal to n1, we have the absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon over two. And if little n is bigger than or equal to two, n2, then little b n minus b in absolute value is less than epsilon over two. So we had to use two different capital N's, n1 and n2, because we don't know the speed at which these sequences converge. They may converge at different rates, we just know that each of them converge. But we can put these two together by taking the maximum. So let's go ahead and set capital N, like our final capital N, equal to the maximum of N1 and N2. And then finally notice that if little n is bigger than or equal to this capital N, so in particular, our n is bigger than or equal to n1 and bigger than or equal to n2 because of how we define this capital N to be the maximum of each one. And now we can go ahead and write down our goal term and then decompose it using the triangle inequality. So that'll go like this. So we have the absolute value of a n plus b n minus a plus b. So that is less than the absolute value of a n minus a plus the absolute value of b n minus b. And this inequality is from the triangle inequality. But then that's less than epsilon over two plus epsilon over two. And this is because of our choice of n one and n two. And then n, which was the maximum of each, but this is equal to epsilon. So now if we look at the extreme left, and right hand side of this inequality, we've shown that the sum of these terms a n and b n minus the sum of the limits capital A and B in absolute value is less than epsilon, which is exactly what we needed to do to show that this limit was true. Okay, so I'll clean up the board and then we'll do another. Now we're gonna look at the case when we take the product of these two sequences. In other words, we wanna show that the limit as n goes to infinity of a n times b n is equal to a times b. So the limit of a product is equal to the product of the limit. So let's see, again, we're gonna kind of start with what we wanna end up with and then decompose that and put it back together into a formal proof. So we have a sub n, b sub n minus a b. Our goal is for that to be less than epsilon. So we cannot factor that out into like a sub n minus a and b sub n minus b yet unless we add some terms in there. So what we'll do is add one term and subtract the same term. And what we're gonna do is add and subtract an A, the limiting value of A, and then the nth term from the B sequence. So in other words, we're gonna have A sub N, B sub N minus A times B sub N. And then we're gonna add that into plus A times B sub N minus A times B. And our goal is for that to be less than epsilon. Okay, so now notice we can factor some stuff out of the first two and the last two terms. So notice out of the first two terms, we can factor out a bn, and that's gonna give us the absolute value of, now we have bn and then an minus a plus, and now we can factor an a out of this, and we have bn minus b 
less than epsilon. Great. Now we can use the triangle inequality again. It's a problem if this were not being done in reverse, but when we write it carefully, we're okay, just like in the last case. So we can split this apart into the absolute value of b sub n times the absolute value of a sub n minus a plus the absolute value of a times the absolute value of b sub n minus b, which is less than epsilon. But now we can use the fact that the sequence b sub n is bounded because it converges, we proved that in a previous video, to say that this term right here is less than m for some positive number m. And then notice we've got some sort of control over this too because we have a constant a here as well. And then furthermore, we have control over this a sub n minus a and this b sub n minus b term. So if we can make this a sub n minus a smaller than epsilon over 2m, and this b sub n minus b smaller than epsilon over 2 times the absolute value of a, then we're good to go because all of that will add up to epsilon. Okay, so now let's see how we can rewrite this carefully. Okay, so as we move to the proof, we're first going to invoke the fact that b n is bounded. So let's notice, since the sequence b n converges, it is bounded which tells us that there exists some m which is bigger than zero such that every term from b n in absolute value is less than m and that's for all n which are natural numbers. So that's the first thing that we wanna do. And now the next thing that we wanna do is build our capital N1 and our capital N2 so that this kind of action occurs. So let's say we're given epsilon bigger than zero, let's take capital N1 and capital N2, those are both natural numbers, so that if little n is bigger than or equal to N1, we want this inequality, um, a sub n minus a is less than epsilon over 2m. So again, we know the sequence a n converges to a, so we can make that as small as we want. How small do we want it? epsilon over 2m. And then we also want, if n is bigger than or equal to n2, we'll have bn minus b is less than epsilon over twice the absolute value of a. Again, this is kind of motivated by this over here. Now, there might be a little bit of a problem here if a is equal to zero, that absolute value of a, the limit, I should say, is equal to zero, but I'll let you guys check that on your own. So I'll just put that here, check if this limit is equal to zero, what happens? Okay, great. But now notice if we take our capital N to be the maximum of N1 and N2, then we can arrive at this line right here and work backwards. So let's go ahead and do that. So now we're gonna set capital N equal to the maximum of our two other Ns, N1 and N2, and notice if our little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, we have our a n times b n minus a times b in absolute values is less than this line over here by our previous calculation. So I'll write that down. This is m times the absolute value of a n minus a plus absolute value of a times absolute value of b n minus b. Great, but now notice that that is less than m times epsilon over 2m plus capital A times epsilon over 2 times capital A in absolute values. But notice that those add up to epsilon. And now if we analyze the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this inequality, we'll see that it's the exact inequality that we need in order to prove this limit. Okay, great. So I'll clean up the board and we've got one more to do. For our last property, we're gonna prove that the limit as n goes to infinity of a n over b n is capital A over capital B, and that's if b is not equal to zero. You can't really make sense of this if b is equal to zero without resorting to infinite limits, but we're not there yet. And we're not actually gonna prove this, we're gonna prove the special case 
when the sequence on the top is just one, but then you can apply part three, in other words, the multiplicative property to form this one. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some scratch calculations like we did in the other cases. So what we want is the absolute value of one over bn minus one over b to be less than epsilon. Now I wanna find a common denominator so I can put those together. So notice that common denominator will be bn times capital B. And so that'll give us the absolute value of bn minus b over bn times b is less than epsilon. So all I've done there is found a common denominator and combined those fractions and then flip the order just because I have an absolute value. Now I can split this up into the absolute value of bn minus b over the absolute value of bn times b is less than epsilon. And the thing to notice here is that we can go ahead and make this thing as small as we want, like we're good with the term bn minus b because we know that the limit of the bn terms approaches b. So this part is good, we can make that as small as we want. And then this part down here, we also know where that converges to. And so that's gonna converge to absolute value of b squared. We, we already have an absolute value of b term, and then the bn's converge to b, so that's just gonna converge to the absolute value of b squared. So now it's a little bit tricky of how to construct this, so we're just gonna jump into the proof and point back to why this works. So given epsilon bigger than zero, we're gonna pick two n values, just like we did before. So pick n1 and n2, those are natural numbers. And the first one is going to be chosen so that if little n is bigger than or equal to n1, we have control over this guy right here. We have the absolute value of bn minus b is less than epsilon times the absolute value of b squared over 2. Great. And so that's going to counteract this absolute value of b squared, which is showing up in the denominator of our scratch work over there. And we'll see why this 2 is necessary. Okay, so now the next thing is we have chosen our n2 so that if n is bigger than or equal to n2, we have the absolute value of bn minus b is less than the absolute value of b over two. Now that may not seem super helpful, but it's pretty easy to see that this implies that the absolute value of bn is bigger than the absolute value of b over two. Great. But now what we can do from here is take the reciprocal of this inequality, and that's gonna give us something useful. It's gonna give us an inequality involving one over the absolute value of bn, which is exactly what we have right here. So let's see what that's gonna look like. We have one over absolute value bn will be less than two over the absolute value of b. And now we can start putting this all together. So we're gonna do the same kind of thing that we did in the last case. So we'll set capital N equal to the maximum of our other Ns, N1 and N2. And notice if N is bigger than or equal to this capital N, we have exactly what we want. We have the absolute value of one over BN minus one over B. Well, first of all, that is equal to the absolute value of BN minus B over absolute value of b times one over the absolute value of bn. Great. But now notice that this numerator right here is less than epsilon times absolute value of b squared over two. So we have this thing is less than epsilon times absolute value of b squared over two times the absolute value of b. So that is all of this term right here and then this guy right here is less than two over the absolute value of B. So that's two over absolute value of B. So just to reiterate, that is that term which I've underlined in red. But now if you multiply that out, everything cancels except for the epsilon. So you have epsilon here. And now if we carefully look at the extreme left and right hand side of this equation, we have the correct inequality between them. We have exactly what we need in order to prove that the sequence one over b n converges to one over b, which when combined with the multiplicative property that we proved in part three, will give us this part four. 
Okay, so I'm gonna clean up the board and give a summary of this whole. Thing. Okay, to summarize these algebraic properties of limits that we've just proved, if we suppose that the sequence AN converges to A, the sequence BN converges to B, and C is a non-zero real number, we have the limit as N goes to infinity of C times AN is equal to C times A. In other words, you can factor this constant C out of the limit. The limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus b n is equal to a plus b. In other words, you can pull the limit apart with addition. The limit as n goes to infinity of a n times b n equals a times b. In other words, you can pull the limit apart with multiplication. And finally, the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n over b sub n is a over b provided that b is not equal to zero. Okay, that's a good place to stop.